sacrifice wasn't just going to the cross, although that was a, a major, major thing. The fact that he was born into this world, that God himself would take on flesh and live in this corrupt place for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Thank the Lord. What a great and mighty Savior. Awesome just doesn't quite make it, but it's as close as it comes, hallelujah, in, her, in human terms, how we can declare this mighty God, this everlasting Father, this Prince of Peace. In Jesus' name, everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Give him a hand this morning. Praise God. <laughs> amen. Amen. God bless you all. May be seated. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Tim, as always. Great job. Appreciate it so much the way you bring us into the presence of the Lord and help us to kind of come together and into the spirit and uh, shed off the things from outside and just come in and, and uh, make God real to us. Praise the Lord. It's great and we appreciate it. Thank you, Suzanne, for leading us in worship as always. You and Mike doing all that you do and we have such great appreciation for you too. And, and all that you do. And all of you that are out there on the internet and Facebook, we love you and appreciate you as well. And to all the people who have supported this church over the last year, it's, it's amazing and we are so grateful. It's a struggle for all of us, amen. And, uh, but we live by faith and God always proves himself faithful, amen. And, and so we're so thankful for all of you being out there with us. And uh, may God bless you in the new year. And all of us, as he has never done before, in a greater way than we've ever experienced. And I believe that's what's coming in the new year. Praise the Lord. There'll be challenges. There'll be all of the things that we deal with in, in life. Amen. But God is there. And that makes us more than conquerors and victorious in any situation and every situation. So praise God. Amen. So I just want to share a few little life observations with you this morning. Y'all go to Starbucks at all? I mean, that, I, 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 some ni really nice people gave us some uh, gift cards to uh, Starbucks. I, I, I go to every once in a while, and, and I'll get some cafe mocha or something. There's something different than a, just a regular coffee, and, and that's all good. But, you know, you stand in line, and you've got all these millennials in front of you. And it's just weird. I think the whole purpose of Starbucks is for people with no decision-making ability whatsoever to make six decisions just to buy one cup of coffee. They have it short, tall, light, dark, calf, decaf, gluten-free, no gluten-free, low-fat, non-fat. And then they add their own little tweaks to all of that, and you're standing there thinking, can I just get a cup of coffee? I mean, come on. And so people who don't know what they're doing or even who they are on earth can for less than five bucks get not just a cup of coffee but an absolute defining sense of self. <laughs> Praise the Lord. They're doing a wonderful thing, Starbucks is. Giving people value while they rip you off for a six or eight dollar cup of coffee. I, I mean, come on. Five dollars for a cup of coffee? That ain't right. Praise God. Hill. Well, you know, as you get older, uh, three things happen. First, you, your memory goes. And I can't remember the other two. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I grew up with uh, five siblings, two sisters and three brothers. And that's how I learned to dance, waiting for the bathroom. <laughs> You know, Sally was, uh, I don't want to pick on her today, but she was a little annoying this morning. And so I told her, you know, you're really pushing my buttons this morning, Sally. And she said, which one is mute? <laughs> Praise the Lord. God bless you. Hallelujah. Well, let's, let's get to the word of God this morning. Amen. I, I was, uh, what, what kind of tripped me on this was I was watching just a little bit of the news. I don't watch much news, but I happened to be flicking through looking for another ball game. And there was some news on, and it was showing in England the, I don't know if anybody else saw this, but the highway, it was like an eight-lane road, and that thing was totally shut down. I mean, it was bumper to bumper, and nobody was moving. And then there was another big area off to the side of the road that was filled with trucks. They can't get anywhere. I mean, they can't move the traffic. Everybody's trying to get out of there. 
You know, they're, they're talking about this latest strain of the virus and how it's far more infectious. I think the, the end results are the same. I mean, the, what, what happens is all, is all the same. It's just that it's easier to get. And it's apparently really bad in, in England especially. They're trying to get out of there to get into Europe. And a few countries are allowing some of them to come in, like France and some others. But uh, the people are just trying to escape. You know, they're just trying to get away. And it was just, it was weird. It was just weird to see it. It looked like L.A. in the highest peak, you know, peak hour. And the, it's, nobody's moving. I mean, it's just like a parking lot that's supposed to be a road. Amen. So that kind of got me to thinking. Imagine all the paranoia. Imagine all the fear and angst that's going on. If these people are that desperate that they're willing to sit there in traffic for eight hours, ten hours or something before they move a, a half a mile. I mean, it's crazy. But it got me to thinking about some things. And so that's what I want to share with you this morning. And Tim touched on a lot of this as well, as he always does. It's amazing how this like spirit kind of connects and echoes and and. Uh, you know, constantly affirms and, and reaffirms things that the Spirit is saying. So I want to begin with uh, Judges chapter 21, verse 25, which is the last verse in the book of Judges. I preached from here before, but not this message, I promise you. And so this is a, talking about in the days of the Judges. He said, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You know, we become our own God. We become our own. I mean, that's the world that we live in, to be quite frank. And then the very next verse is the first verse, the book of Ruth. And so everybody was doing what they thought they should do, right? And it says, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, there wasn't a king, right? There was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn he and his wife and his two sons. I want to read through verse 6. So the name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab... The name of the one was Oprah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Now I'll just repeat something that Tim says quite frequently, and, and rightly so. I've never seen God seed begging bread, right? I've never seen him starving. I've never seen him begging bread. So these people were children of God. Now, I have to say this, that in those days, that woman's voice didn't mean much. So it was Elimelech, I promise you, that decided we need to bail out here. We need to get out of here and go to Moab, right? Because we're here and things are just getting worse. You know, there's no bread, there's no food, there's none of this stuff. Well, so most of us have lived long enough. Let me, let me just back up a minute. When, when they went, they were in the house of bread. But there was this talk going around that there's a famine. So Eliminek decides, well, we'll just bail out. We'll just go somewhere else. We'll find some place where there isn't a famine, right? So he goes to Moab. Well, look at this in Psalms 11 and verse 3. Psalm 11 and verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, first of all, I'm going to say Ruth, Elimelech, and their sons were the righteous. They were, they were in the covenant of God. They were Bethlehem, Judah, you know. But if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, most of us have lived long enough to know that we don't need to ask the question, if the foundations be destroyed. We're living in the age when many of the foundations have been or are right now being destroyed. And the things that make us great over the years as a people and as a nation, helping us build great institutions, raise productive children, 
defend our country and much of the rest of the world are the very foundations that are being destroyed before our eyes in this generation. You know, I grew up in a small town where there was never a locked door. We had a latch on the screen door, and that was only so the wind wouldn't blow it open. When we'd go away, which wasn't that often, but when we would, we'd just tell the neighbor, hey, we're going to be gone for a few days. And that was it. Try that today. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The question today, in these days, these days of crumbling foundations that I ask myself is, what are the righteous to do? What are, what are we going to do? What are we supposed to do? Well, look at Psalms 11 and verse 1. In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? And a lot of people are tempted to do just that. Flee as a bird to your mountain. But David, he takes an exception to that advice. And he says, how say ye to my soul, flee? These are not the times for us to flee. After all, where are you going to go? I mean, there's no safe place to hide. This thing is everywhere. Yeah. Right? And the consequences are everywhere. These are times when the righteous need to make their calling and election sure. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. I'm not trying to depress you. I'm trying to set you up. Praise the Lord. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fail or never fall. Praise the Lord. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in this present truth. Praise the Lord. So today, in these time of crumbling foundations, we need to have total confidence in God. Amen. We need to know God, and we need to know He's on the throne. But there's another thing. Those of us who are sure of God's grace and His goodness and His protection and provision still need to put on the whole armor of God. Not just the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of, sal uh, of righteousness, which are important, but we need the whole armor of God. We have to be prepared. We have to be fully equipped. The devil's working in government, in homes, in the workplace, in society in general. And we've got to keep believing with all the wickedness, all the cynicism, all the sarcasm of this humanistic, secular society that God is still in charge, that God still has control over his people. Amen. Look at Mark chapter 5, verses 35 and 36. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead, why troublest the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Amen. So remember what Jesus said. Just keep believing. I don't care what you're hearing. I don't care what you're seeing. I don't care what you're, what's being reported. Keep believing. Amen. You know, Naomi and, and her family, they were listening to the stuff. And they got so freaked that Elimelech said, let's beat it. Let's get out of here. Let's run. And what was the result of that? They're dead. Right? I don't care what the skeptics say. This is the word of God. I still believe he was born of a virgin. I still believe he's the son of God. God in the flesh. I believe Jesus Christ. All other ground is sinking sand. I believe they crucified him and he died. I believe he rose up with all power. And it may look like a spiritual famine. It may look like the enemy's in control. But I'm telling you, God is saying today, just keep believing. Just keep believing. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Let's read this in Ephesians chapter 1. I want to read a lengthy 
uh, bit here. Uh, Ephesians 1, verses 1 through 14. Ephesians 1, 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, under the praise of His glory. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Well, you know, we actually started out uh, talking about Ruth and the story of Ruth. Naomi and her husband and her two sons left home. They moved to Moab because they'd heard there was a famine in the land. Bad news. And they got scared and ran. The literal meaning of the Hebrew name for their hometown, Bethlehem, actually means house of bread. Lahem, right, is bread. Beth is home. Beth Lahem. It's the house of bread. The bread was part of the temple practices too. It was more than just something they ate, obviously. It was proof of God's presence. And this is what's so bizarre about this story. Showbread. Bread of the presence. Bread's always been one of the historically accurate ways or indications of God's presence. In the Old Testament, that bread in the form of showbread was in the holy place, right? Along with the candle and the so forth. Look at, let's look at this quickly in Numbers chapter 4 and verse 7. Upon the table of shewbread, they shall spread a cloth of blue and put there on the dishes and the spoons and the bowls and the covers to cover with all. And the continual bread shall be thereon. So it's called the shoe bread and the continual bread. In the, uh, uh, let's see, what is it? The New Reserve Standard Version, I think it is. It calls it the bread of his presence. Translates as the bread of his presence, this continual bread. Meaning his presence is always with us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. Amen. The show bread actually is better interpreted as show up bread. Amen. Or in Hebraic terms, face bread. So you would be looking into the face of God. When you took the bread, when you took the show bread, it was as if you were looking at God and God was looking at you. It was a symbol of God himself. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Amen. And God left Bethlehem. Huh? I mean, had God left the house of bread? God's house? It doesn't make any sense at all. Or was Abimelech just skewing his focus because of the difficulties, because of the hardships? Was he just looking at things the wrong way simply because of the reports that were coming in? Amen. They succumbed to the natural uh, fear, uh, the natural world's kind of definition, and they put their trust in it. 
even though they had a covenant with God, they were trusting in the, in the noise that was going on around them rather than looking to the God, their source, their protection, and their provision. You know where Moab comes from? I mean, this ought to tell us something. It's the name of the incestuous son, right, of Lot. That's who inhabited this place. Amen? It, the actual, the root word for that, Moab, is mul. And it means to destroy or to cut down. I mean, come on. You're in the house of bread and you want to go get destroyed and cut down? That's the kind of thinking that goes, there's no rationale here. It's just fear. It's just being promoted. It's just being, uh, you know, encouraged because of uncertainty, because of doubt, because of the rumors that are floating, because of the, the latest fear that's out there, because of the next story of some, you know, uh, news reporter who knows absolutely nothing but what he's reading off of a paper in front of him. And, and we're to believe that they have this great insight. They don't have sick of them. All they've got is script. Read the script. They don't, they don't know. They're just saying. They're talking heads, as they used to say. Amen? So here's what I'm saying. This is an alternative that can be deadly. Moab is a cruel place. Amen? Moab will steal your sons. Moab will separate you from your spouse. Moab will literally rob you of the vitality of life. Praise the Lord. In the end, Naomi was left with two daughters-in-law and nothing else. Absolutely nothing but two pagan Gentile daughter-in-laws. Look at Ruth chapter 1 verse 6. Then she rose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. It wasn't a rumor. It was a testimony. Hey, there's bread in, Jeru there's, there's bread in Bethlehem. I don't know what you're doing over here, but God's in Bethlehem. Amen. Your covenant-keeping God is back where you left. And she hears this rumor or this testimony there really is bread in the house of bread. The bread of His presence. God is with His people. God is among His people. Praise the Lord. Amen. Jesus said, I don't care what you hear. I don't care what you've heard. I don't care what you see. I don't care what you've seen. I only care about what you believe. Praise the Lord. No matter what the world says. No matter what it seems in the natural. No matter what you need. No matter what you feel you're lacking in life. All you really need is Him. The bread of life. Amen? And for that, all you really need is faith and faithfulness. Praise the Lord. Look at John chapter 6, verses 63 through 69. John 6, 63 through 69. It's the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me, except it were given unto him of my Father. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you go away also? Then Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So where are we going to run? God is with us. Right? He's, he's where we are. Praise the Lord. The book of Ruth is a journal of God's faithfulness to three faithful people. One was a Gentile. But here's what I'm thinking. No man comes to God except the Spirit draws him. This was a divine encounter. This wasn't just some random weird thing. It was a poor choice on Abimelech's side. But it was the choice that would bring this Gentile woman into the family of God. 
and you'll see as we go along and, and produce actually the line of Christ himself. Without her, it couldn't have happened. It's amazing. We don't understand sometimes why we do a lot of the things we do, but our steps are directed to the Lord. And there's a purpose in our lives, a divine destiny for each and every one of us. Praise the Lord. See, Naomi was too, too old to remarry and have more children because the, the Hebrew tradition was she would give the next son to that daughter-in-law and the next son to that daughter-in-law. That's how it worked. Your, your son dies, there's a widow, you give the next son to that widow to raise up the family and keep the family name alive. But she couldn't do that because she was too old to have any more children, so she couldn't provide husbands for Oprah or Ruth. Now look at Ruth now, chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 7 through 22. Ruth 1, 7 through 22. Praise God. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. Lord, grant you that ye may find rest, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. They said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will ye go with me? Are there not... Are there yet any more sons in my womb that you may be that may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have any husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons. Well, she's saying you'd be old women before they were old enough to be your husband. So where would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it is grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me and they lifted up their voices and wept again and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law but Ruth clave unto her and she said behold thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods return thou after thy sister-in-law and Ruth said entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee for whither thou goest I will go where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Praise God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So they went, the two went, until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full. Now she said they went out because there was a famine. She said, Hindsight isn't always 2020, although it will be next year. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye Naomi, call me Naomi, seeing that the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth and the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. So again, this is a person who made a horrible choice and now blaming God for the choice that they made, right? It wasn't God. God had nothing to do with it. They left the presence of God to go to Moab. And now they're blaming God for them having left. Amen? Look at the... They, here they are. They're back in Bethlehem with absolutely nothing. They're, they're worse than broke. They are homeless. They're impoverished. They have nothing. Nothing whatsoever. Except the clothes on their back. Look at Ruth uh, chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. So they come back and it's the time of the barley harvest. There's a... The, they're, they're reaping the barley harvest just as they arrive. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. Now, this is all part of the covenant that they have with God. These are all parts of the rules that are laid out for the children of God. 
So he says, and Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, go, my daughter. This is somebody coming to Jesus. Amen. They're, they have nothing. They're, they're at the end of everything. And so let me go. Let me go to God and see if he'll give me grace. Amen. We know Boaz is the, you know, the type of kinsman redeemer. But that's she has this in her mind. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is dealing with this woman. I've got a plan for your life. I have a destiny for you. And she doesn't understand it. But she thinks maybe this near kin will have favor, show favor or show me grace so that we can survive, right? Because only the poor and only the aliens or Gentiles were permitted to glean the grain left behind by the harvest workers. Amen. Remember the story, the woman, uh, she was a Gentile, she was a Syrophoenician, she comes to Jesus and she, she's reaching out to him and she, he says, uh, it's, it's not meat to give the children's bread you know, to the dogs or to the Gentiles. Well, this, this, she's a Gentile. But she's just like this woman. She's saying, yeah, but, you know, even, even the dogs eat the crumbs. Even the Gentiles get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. That's what she's doing here. She's getting the crumbs that are left over from this great harvest that belong to the children of God. But God's going to let her, by grace, get a little something. Uh, right? Some crumbs, some, some of the droppings, amen, that they didn't get into their bags, amen, when they were doing the harvest, right? So here's the deal. Ruth looked beyond, and this is what we've got to be doing. Ruth looked beyond the natural of getting a few handfuls of provision. She looked to the possibility of winning the favor of Boaz. Whoa, she had some high hopes. Amen. I'm not just looking to get through life. I'm looking, like Tim said this morning, I'm looking for the author and finisher of my faith. I want to know him. Amen. I want to, I want to have, I want to experience that grace in ways that I've never imagined, that I didn't believe I could. I don't want to just be, you know, scraping around here, skimping around, trying to get by, trying to survive COVID-19 or the government's goofiness and all the rest. No, I want the grace of God. I want God's presence. I want his favor. Amen. And the rest of it, I'm not worried about because if I can get that, the rest of the stuff will all be taken care of. Yes. Amen. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. So look at, look at Romans chapter 8 verses 16 and 17. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Amen. Ruth somehow looked beyond the desperation of the situation, beyond the circumstances in the natural, this weird bad situation with nothing to look forward to nothing to hope for but just to eke out a somehow enough to live on to to feed yourself right and she looked beyond all of that to see her true inheritance her inheritance in the family of her late husband and father-in-law just like jesus our kinsman redeemer amen i'm not looking for anything I'm doing to get me favor with God. No. I'm just looking to God because that's what he does. He shows favor. Yes. He gives grace to those who are in need, to those who come before him. Praise the Lord. Amen. She gained a mother-in-law who believed still and trusted God and his covenant. Because if you read the story, it's Naomi who says, you know, do this and do that. She knows the covenant. She understands it and she's relying on it. Ruth's relationship with Naomi was more than just cold demands of the law. It was more than just regulations and rules. It entered into a relationship, a mother-daughter relationship, a love relationship. The love of God is what she was experiencing. It was through Naomi's example of faith 
we're going back to Bethlehem. We don't have anything, but at least God is there. Amen? And it was that example of faith that Ruth provided a means for Ruth to first access the anointing of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Made it possible for her to believe something more than she had ever believed before. Ruth chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. She fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thy sight, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? Doesn't that sound again like the Syrophoenician woman who comes on her hands and knees and just touch, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, right? And she said, how, how, how can, and he said, your faith has made you whole, right? So thou hast done unto my mother-in-law since the death of my husband. Now this is Boaz talking. He says, I, it's, it's been fully showed me all that you have done unto my mother, uh, unto the, your mother-in-law since the death of your, her husband and how thou hast left your father and your mother and the land of your nativity and are come unto a people which you don't know before. The Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. He recognizes she's come to believe and to put her confidence in God, in the one true and living God. Amen. Ruth had a divine appointment, and it was an appointment with destiny. And because she was trusting enough to act on that faith, looking through and beyond the natural circumstances to what the grace of God could provide. Romans 7, verses 1 through 4. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead and she's loosed from the law of her husband, <coughs> so then if while her husband liveth she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she's free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should mar be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. That's our story, but that's Ruth's story. Yes. It's just Ruth telling us our story. Praise the Lord. To marry Ruth, Boaz had to buy back all the land, all the property of Naomi and her late husband. And he'd also be responsible to pay any debts that they had. Does that sound familiar? After Boaz, Ruth and he were married. After Bo Boaz had done all that, they were married. And they had a son. And they named him Obed. And Obed had a son, and they named him Jesse. And Jesse had a son, and they named him David. The line of Jesus Christ. I mean, God is no respecter of persons. He could have picked any Jew, any devout Jew for this, but he said, no. I want everybody to know they are included. Everyone has access to the grace of God. Every human being has the ability to come to God and receive all that they have need of by faith and faith alone. See, Ruth is a classic example for us today. She learned to persevere for a purpose right in the middle of difficulty and disappointment. She had every reason to be disappointed with life. She had every reason to be bitter about her situation. But she chose to hang on and to believe in the most crucial time of her life. And it brought about a total and permanent change in her life's direction. And that choice still impacts us today. Praise God. Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Can we not do as much? Praise the Lord. I mean, that's what I'm asking myself. If this little pagan woman could change the whole direction of her life and all of her offspring following her, and not only 
change the direction of their life, but to bring God into this world. Can I believe God to make it past COVID-19? Can I believe God for my finances? Can I believe God for my health? Can I believe God for my family? Of course I can. I've found grace in the eyes of God. I'm not just picking up the crumbs that are falling at the end of the field. I'm getting the bushel baskets. I'm getting the harvest, the abundant harvest of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm not working to get a little bit to get by. I'm living in the master's house. I, I, he has become my father. Amen. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Amen. I mean, we either believe it or we don't. That's the word of God. Yes. That is settled in heaven. Praise God. Look at Mark chapter 10, verses 26 through 31. Mark 10, 26 through 31. Praise God. It's not a time to be depressed. It's not a time to be frightened. It's not a time to run. This is a time to stand your ground and believe that God has a miracle for us and He's going to show this world the power and the might of His majesty over all the kingdoms of this earth. Yes. The pride and the arrogance of governments and humans. He, he mocks them with derision. He laughs at their stupidity. But He embraces our trust and our faith in Him. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it's impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. And then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we've left everything, and we followed you. And Jesus answered and said, Listen, man. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. There is no man that has left a house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels. Think about Ruth now. And think about us before we were born again. We were in the kingdom of darkness. We were in another land, right? But he shall receive a hundredfold now in this life. Here, now, in the natural. Houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. Yeah, we're getting some crap, but that goes with the territory, right? I can tell you, that is a fact for me. I think about Tim talking about with his buddies and the cockroaches running. Listen. I lived in an old house in South Carolina, and there wasn't any electricity, there wasn't any water, all there was was cats and three guys smoking dope and, and shooting bottle rockets at each other all day, 24 hours a day. It was a pit. I had nothing, man. I mean, and, and some people would look at our home and things now and say, well, I, I mean, it's just there. But listen, I've been to the other side of this thing. I've been where there was nothing. I've been where I was homeless. Amen. I've been where I abandoned a 61 Ford station wagon. I was doing some construction work. I just left it. It was such a piece of junk anyway. And hitchhiked to Wisconsin and then hitchhiked to uh, Colorado and Mexico and then back to the United States and California and back to the East Coast. I've been all over this country and lived like an idiot. And yet God has given, I sit on my back deck and I look out there and I say, Jesus, this is because of you. It's not anything I've done. It's not because of my brilliance. It isn't because of my planning or anything else. It's God. It's God's hand right before me saying, see, this is what I do for my children. No matter how hard you try to find yourself, to find uh, peace, to find a high, to escape the issues and the problems and so on in life, I've got the answers. And not only do I meet your immediate need, but I give you a future and a hope for your family, for your children, and for the next that come after. If he'll do this for me, he'll do it for anybody. Praise the Lord. But he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, now his brothers, sisters, mothers, children, lands, with persecutions and with the world in the eternal life. But many that are first shall be last. And the last shall be first. They, there's a lot of people looking at us as well. We're idiots. We're the losers. We're the nobodies. We know nothing. It's only the elite, the political field, the, you know, the hierarchy and the, uh, the antichrist kind of mentality that, oh, that is just stupid. You know, you don't know. God. Yeah, maybe there's a God, but he's not involved in any of this stuff. And after all, we, 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 we have uh, developed from apes, you know, and we're, we're, we're actually just another animal form here. And all the, all, the, all the other BS that goes along with all of that. And they look to us. 
us and I go, you people are so stupid. Well, this scripture's all over. This is one of them. The last shall be first. We may be counted as last, but I promise you, we will be first. We will be exalted. We will be lifted up. Amen. I saw princes. He said in one scripture, it talks about these very times, I believe, where he said there are princes leading servants on horseback. In other words, it's telling you everything's upside down and it's backwards. The princess should be on the horse. The servant should be leading the horse. We are the princes. Amen. Kings and, and, and princes in the kingdom of God. Amen. And we're the ones that are doing the labor. We're the ones, you know, pulling the horses so the idiots can get on there. We are the last, amen, that are going to be first because we were first to begin with. Amen. God's got a plan, and no matter how chaotic and confusing it might look in the natural, there is a de destiny for each and every one of us, and I promise you, we're going to get there because God can do nothing else. Yes, amen. He makes the end from the beginning, and the beginning from the end. As far as He's concerned, the moment we came to Him, and it was predestined, amen, that we would come, not by God, but predestined by the, the, the life that we live and the choices that we made, that we would become the sons of God. That we would be the righteousness of God. That we would be the first and not the last. Hallelujah. Ruth dealt with her biggest disappointment by choosing to trust God. She chose to stake all of her hopes, all of her dreams, all of her desires for a future with the God of Israel. With the bread of life. So during a crisis, the worst thing we can do is give up and deny God the opportunity to work in our lives and to show Himself mighty, to be glorified. Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So when crisis strikes, most people naturally cling to what's most familiar to them. And that's usually temporal things. Their home, their culture, their possessions, their religion. But Ruth refused to cling to those things. She set her sights on a much greater hope. She didn't react to her circumstance. She responded to God. And we're seeing people react to circumstances here. And God's saying, I don't want reactions. I want responses. I want you to respond to me, not re react to the situation or the circumstance that we're seeing or dealing with. Jesus never reacted. He always responded. Let me show you just quickly in John chapter 20, verses 18 through 22. This is just one example, but John 20, 18 through 22. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, for fear of the circumstances and the situation that they were involved in, came Jesus and stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said so, or so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now this is the first time, think about this, this is the first time Jesus had seen these people since the resurrection. The last time they saw him and he saw them, they were all running away from him. All he saw was their backsides. But does Jesus bring it up? He doesn't mention it. It's as though it never happened. Because in the mind of God, it didn't happen. His forgiveness released these disciples to their destiny. To be who they were destined to be. Who they were born to be. Not fishermen. Disciples. Believers. 
And Jesus chose to respond to their failure by serving them, not condemning them. The next day, he fixed breakfast for them on the beach. I mean, come on. That's a pretty good God. I like the beach. I like breakfast. Praise the Lord. I like Jesus. Hallelujah. But his forgiveness, his faith, amen, released the disciples to be able to start over again, to pick themselves up and get back on the path, back to their destiny, back to their purpose, back to their God. And our solution to life's challenges is simple. Face the disappointments, face the challenges by running to God. Not running from the situation, but running to our Heavenly Father. Running to the arms of our Father. Into the grace and the goodness and the provision. His mercies are new every morning, every day. Thank God. Boaz, our type of Jesus, the kinsman redeemer. Ruth, type of the church, the bride of Christ. That's us. Isaiah 62 Verses 4 and 5. I'm just going to read a few scriptures here and then we'll close. But look at Isaiah chapter 62, verses 4 and 5. This is the word of God. This is God talking to us. Amen. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken. Neither shall thy land any more be determined desolate. But thou shalt be called Hebsabah, and thy land Beulah, beautiful. For the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over you. Praise God. We're sons and brides. It's confusing, but what the heck, God knows what he's doing, right? Amen. Just trust him. Praise the Lord. Colossians 1 and verse 12. giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He redeemed us so that we could have the inheritance that he always wanted us to have. Praise the Lord. And it's just a question of faith and faithfulness to his word. Praise God. Hosea 2, 19 through 21. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. That ought to give you goosebumps, folks. Praise the Lord. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day, I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth. Praise God. Ruth, chapter 4, 21 and 22. And it shall come to pass in that day. And Solomon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. Here's what God is saying to us. Faith in God always results in a manifestation of God. He'll show up. He'll be born into our lives. He'll be born into our situations. He'll be manifest into our circumstances if we believe. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. I am for you, not against you. I am with you. Lo, I will never leave you or forsake you. I'm with you to the end of the earth. Praise the Lord. Last scripture, we'll wrap up with this. End. I want to end with uh, Psalms chapter 11 and the, and the entire chapter. It's just nine verses, chapter 1 through 9. Or excuse me, Psalms 11, verses 1 through 9, where we started. So David said, In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bow, they make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? 
The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in his heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous, Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I'm just going to remind you, too, that, you know, Bethlehem, house of bread, the house of God. And how many of you know that we are now the house of bread? We are Bethlehem, the house of his presence, the place he shows up and shows out. Praise God. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness, and his countenance doth behold the upright, the showbread, the face bread, the bread of his face. He beholds us, and we behold his countenance, the bread of life in Jesus our Savior. There's nothing to be afraid of. If God is for us, who can be against us? This isn't the time to run. This is the time to dig your heels in and say, my God will supply all of my need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. And he'll show the wicked. He'll reveal them. Even in Psalms 91, it says, with our eyes, we will behold and see the reward of the wicked. Praise the Lord. And they'll Behold and see the reward of the righteous, that God is for us, and no man can be against us. The doors he opens, no man can close. The doors he closes, no man can open. I'm trusting in the Lord as my valet. Praise the Lord. He's going to be there for me. He's going to take care of me. He is my shield and my exceeding great reward. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We have, a, we have a great and mighty God. And he has declared us to be his bride. Hallelujah. I promise you, he's going to take care of his bride. He's going to see to it that she gets high and lifted up. The Lord will exalt us. The Lord will lift us up. Amen. And satisfy us with long life. And show us his salvation. That's our promise. From Almighty God. Hallelujah. God bless you all. Happy New Year. Have a great New Year. Believe God for breakthroughs in every area of our lives. We're going to see God show up mightily in our lives and in the lives of the people in, our, in this nation. And we're going to share that with them. We're going to show. Uh, many people are going to come to God. Yeah, there, there are going to be many people who will reject and try to manipulate and control. That's, that's just the way it is. But many, many millions will come to harvest. And we'll be part of that great harvest. The greatest harvest that has ever been. Hallelujah. We'll be, we'll be loading them up. Praise the Lord. We'll just be loading them up. And we'll even get the strays. We'll even pick up some of the strays that get left behind. That haven't been uh, reaped in the initial harvest. And we'll still be there to help to bring them in as well. That's the plan of God and the purpose of God for our lives. And it shall come to pass because whatever he says, it must be because it already is. Yes. Glory to God. Give him one more hand. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless y'all. Happy New Year. Let's enjoy it in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.